Yeah. Hello. So this video is all about the settings and setup that I use on the Canon 5D Mark III. I still love that shutter sound. Still my favourite shutter sound of all time, I think. A lot of people have different things to say about that. Um, a few people have asked me to make this video, and so I should start by saying, if you're not interested in the 5D Mark III, then probably best just to click away, um, and I'll hopefully be able to make something that will be of more interest to you soon. But, you know, for those of us that are into the 5D Mark III, then let's dive on in. So this was my main camera from 2012 until 2018, which is quite a long time. And I still love it. I still use it even today. I've moved on. I shoot the Canon. R5 and 5D Mark IV now, but you know, I still use this in my life as a professional photographer and even just the other day, just this week, I was shooting uh, a big reportage job and I was using this camera along with the other two and it just reminded me of how much I absolutely particularly love the 5D Mark III. I can't remember whether that's because of whether it's the actual camera that I love or whether it's kind of the assignments that I was shooting during the time it was my main camera or some of the pictures that I took with it. For, but for some reason, it just has a very sweet spot in my heart. And I, you know, in many ways, it's a little bit of a classic camera. Now I did make another video about this camera. If you want to get into the nuts and bolts of the review of the camera, so go and look at that. This is all about the settings I use. So let's just begin by talking about kind of how I set it up on the, the kind of the, the, the overall setup. So you will see I've got my Sigma 50mm art lens, which is always a favourite for me um, with this particular camera. And you will see I've got the Canon battery grip on the bottom as well. Now, I don't always use the battery grips. Uh, I've tried a few of the generic ones as well, but I've always been disappointed by the generic ones. They always stop working, and so I've always stuck with Canon pretty much. Um, these things have really one job, and that's just to kind of give you an extra set of controls on the back. And I suppose I've got two jobs, because they also have two batteries inside which elongates your battery life if that's what you are after though this thing has great battery life anyway and so sometimes the grip will be on sometimes it will be off depending on what it is that I'm shooting typically I like using it if I'm doing a lot of portraits because you get the extra shutter button here and the focus control on the back by your thumb which is really useful you know, if you're doing a long day of headshots, for example, or something, or corporate portraits, something like that. But also I will use it if I'm using a long lens, a telephoto lens or a big lens, just because it kind of fits better into my hand. And I think the 5D Mark III is a camera, because it's a bit of a dinosaur and a bit chunky, I think it does kind of, you know, it still loves having the grip attached to it, because it's kind of a big old boy like that, and it kind of just works really nicely. Okay, so I have got the Canon camera strap on here. Now, this thing is weather-beaten and bashed and and good lord, I mean, it has had some abuse over the years, but it's still working fine. And I've stuck with Canon camera straps. I've had my head turned recently by the Peak Design slide strap, which one of my uh, subscribers mentioned in a comment and said I should, should really look into that strap. And so I've been, you know, I started looking on the web kind of you know, looking at different reviews and things. And I'm interested to hear your opinion about camera straps, actually. Let me know your thoughts. What should I be looking at? Should I be sticking with Canon? The reason that I like Canon is that it's just been ultra reliable, never let me down. I've hung my body weight off of this thing a few times, or Canon straps, certainly. And I've used them for all kinds of different appropriate and inappropriate uses. Ca strapping cameras to various different things and tying things up with them. And they've always just worked, always just done what they're supposed to do, and they always work. Um, the reason that I'd be looking to change is that I don't like the, uh, the, I wish they were a bit more discreet. This thing is now a bit more discreet because it's so kind of weather beaten. But I wish that it was just sort of, you know, n didn't shout cannon, cannon, cannon all over it. And also I wish that it was grippy on both sides. Now I can get this thing on and off of the camera in literally kind of uh, 20 seconds. So I don't really have a problem with that. And I worry about those little peak design clips. But this isn't a video about camera straps. Let me know your thoughts. Sorry, I'm going to crack on. So, in terms of um, the settings, I tip, I'm a professional photographer and before most assignments I shoot all kinds of different things. So I have to be careful that I set my cameras up before each shoot, kind of back to a base level, back to, um, back to sort of ground zero, which I can then work on to build on for whatever it is that I'm, I'm shooting at that time. So what I, I, I'm very wary of sort of leaving the camera set up in a specific style for a specific shoot that I've been doing, then going on to another shoot and having to kind of readjust everything back. So I typically adjust everything back to ground zero. And for me, that will be shooting in manual mode or aperture priority. They come and go like the tide. 
I have no preference either way and I use them both side by side without any prejudice either way. Don't use any other exposure. I, uh, sometimes shutter priority, I guess. Um, let's talk about manual. So if we're in manual mode, I will set a shutter speed of 125th of a second because that's a good place to start and an aperture of 5.6 because that seems like a reasonable aperture to start at. Um, and then I'll build my exposure appropriately depending on what it is that I'm shooting, but that's where I start. In terms of ISO, I don't use auto ISO. I never have. I have tried it a few times and I can see why people would like it, but for me, I like knowing where my ISO is. I come from days of shooting film and I think that kind of has stuck something somewhere inside. I guess as time moves on, maybe I will begin to look into it, but for the moment, manual ISO and I start at 400 ISO. It's a great place for me to start. Very old school, actually. In terms of my autofocus with a 5D Mark III, I start on one shot and then adjust accordingly. In terms of motor drive, I will start in single shot and I like the S mode, which is for silent-ish or soft. I don't know what it actually stands for, but it's a lot softer. You can listen. Whereas in um, kind of auto, in full mode, it's much more clacky and then it has a fast, um, fast drive option, which isn't too bad for an old camera, right? Um, but I'll start in single soft because I just kind of like that as a place to begin. Um, in terms of evalu in terms of meet the, 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 how we meter the light, I will use this matrix metering thing, which, to, which when you, the camera looks at the scene and it looks at all the different zones in the scene and works out the correct, what it thinks the correct exposure will be and suggests that to you, rather than spot metering or center weighted metering or just kind of overall metering. I really like the matrix metering because it just gets me to like a good beginning position to start from and then I can adjust accordingly by using the histogram or the screen um, and then altering my exposure accordingly. It's a great tool. In terms of white balance, this thing has the most amazing auto white balance of any camera that I've ever used, I think. It just gets it right pretty much all of the time, and so I use auto white balance pretty much all of the time. That isn't always so true of newer cameras, and there are cameras that are much more expensive than this, that the white balance, you know, you need to fiddle with it quite constantly to kind of get the color that you want. Um, but this thing's been great, so why not use, why not use the tools that are, that are there for you? I'll just talk about memory cards. So this thing has dual camera, dual memory card slots, and I have a 32 gigabyte SD card and a 32 gigabyte CF card in there. Now, this is amazing because, you know, that's 50 quid's worth of cards, right? And that allows me to shoot with this thing all day long. And then I have a perfect raw backup of both of, of all of my images onto two different cards for for really 50 pounds, that's for me is a no brainer. That's what I do. I have both cards set to raw record the same picture to both cards. Other people will, you know, there's an argument that says that you can raw, you know, record raw to one card and high quality JPEG to the other. And then you just kind of keep that as a backup and you know, that's all cool. Other people have different ways of doing it. But for me, that's the way that I work with this camera. Okay, so let's dive into the menu systems and we'll talk through all of that jazz. So here we go. Okay, so here we are in the red camera menu. So to begin with, we have our image quality, both cards set to raw, um, which we talked about before. Image review, which is how long a picture will stay on the screen after you take a frame. Uh, I have that set to hold. You can set the duration if you want to or to off, but I like it on hold so that the picture's always there, just waiting for me to glance down. And it'll stay there until I press, until I take another picture or press a button. Uh, beep is, I have that set to enable because I like the audible confirmation of, of focus being achieved because I'm a bit of a dinosaur, but bear in mind that it is noisy. You know, that is a loud beep and it sounds loud in my experience in a quiet environment. You have to be quite careful, so I will turn that off if I need to. Release shutter without card, I have that set to off, so I don't have any mistakes. Lens aberration correction, I do all of that in post-production, so that's all off and I don't use the external speed light control. Um, in terms of the exposure compensation, that's set to zero. ISO speed settings, I go in here and I have my speed range set to the range that I would like to actually use. So that's set to 12,800 as a maximum. It would go higher, there are a couple of higher settings, but I like leaving mine there because that's the range that I would be happy using. At the, uh, actually, I wouldn't be happy using this camera at 12,800, but you know, I certainly wouldn't be happy using it all the way up there. Even there, look at that. 
oh, really high, high, high settings. That's kind of the absolute maximum that I would go to. My auto ISO, don't really use auto ISO, like I said, but I do have it set, and I have it set to 1600, actually. Um, auto lighting optimizer, I wouldn't have that on, so that's off. White balance is auto white balance. And then we have a color space set to sRGB. Sometimes I use Adobe RGB, but we, we won't climb down that rabbit hole right now. Picture style, standard to begin with. Um, sometimes I might use monochrome, but mostly it's standard, keeps things pretty basic. Long exposure, noise reduction off, high ISO speed, noise reduction. I have that set to standard, but you can affect that in post-production if you shoot raw. Um, highlight tone priority set to off. And then we have our HDR, HDR modes down here, which we'll talk about in just a minute. And then over we go to live view settings. I have my live view enabled, but I don't really use it very often on this camera because to be perfectly honest, it's not the best on the 5D Mark III. Um, live mode in the AF mode, 3.2, 3 by 2 aspect ratio, exposure simulation, I have that set to enable so that you can see any changes that you make to your exposure. Uh, silent LV mode, I have that set to disable because I can't actually hear much of a difference between any of these things. Someone else could tell me different. Don't really use live view very much though. Okay, over onto AF. We have case one. I use case one most of the time. In fact, nearly all of the time. I found it to be the most kind of useful for general settings. I've tried the others and to be honest, I can't really detect much of a difference. Um, I think if you're shooting a very specific type of sport or movement, then you might want to fiddle with those different case studies and you know work up your um, AF settings a little bit more uh, accurately. Um, AI servo, first image and second image priority, I have both of those set to kind of somewhere in the middle. Um, AF assist beam, I have that set to firing because it's really useful in the dark or darker conditions. It will help you focus. Uh, nothing else there. Lens drive when impossible. Um, don't have that set. I have that set to on, but to be perfectly honest, I don't really know what it is. Selectable AF point, I have that set to the cross type AF points because I find them to be the most accurate. And then select AF area selection mode. I just use these two little ones here because I find them to be the most accurate. Um, and then orientation linked AF point, I have that set to select separate AF points because if you're shooting upright and landscape quite regularly and you, you can set your AF point uh, zone and then the camera will remember it when you flip between portrait and landscape, uh, upright or landscape, holding the camera up into take portraits or landscapes. It's very useful and saves you having to uh, keep moving the AF point around. Hope that makes sense. Okay, um, and then micro AF micro adjustment. This camera does allow you to kind of uh, micro adjust each lens to the camera, and I do it. I adjust each lens, each lens individually, set it all up, and it works really, really well to help with your um, getting the maximum image quality from your lenses. Um, okay, over we go to the blue button. Now I don't really use very much in here, so there's absolutely nothing in there that I use nothing in there that I use and in here the magnification I just use it four times because I think that's a reasonable um, reasonable compromise and then the highlight alert I have that enabled so that when I play back my pictures if I've blown the highlights I can see. Um, over onto the spanner record function card folder select I have that set to record separately uh, file number auto reset and file name I put my own name in there. Uh, auto rotate, uh, I have that set to on. Auto power off is eight minutes. Uh, auto LCD brightness, and then my date and time, I have this set very accurately, and I sync all of my cameras before I shoot, so I can sort the pictures afterwards by um, time, by the time that the pictures were taken, and that means that the, the kind of shoot will flow, um, even if I've used three cameras, so long as they're synced, then it'll, it'll sort all the pictures kind of by the, the time they were taken rather than by which camera they were taken on when I put it into Lightroom. Um, nothing there, so much of much interest. Okay, so on we go. Video system, I have that set to PAL, but I'm not going to talk about video today. Over we go. So custom shooting modes, I don't really use that too much on this camera, to be perfectly honest, because it's rather a basic camera, rather than, you know, I've started using custom shooting modes on more complex cameras, but on this, I'm kind of cool not to. Uh, exposure level increments in the in the orange camera icon, I set those to a third, third of a stop, pretty old school. And then as we move along, we have, I have my warnings in the viewfinder, I have everything set because I hate it when you have something specific like high ISO or a different picture profile set 
and then you forget about it. So I have it all set so it'll set up a warning for me. Um, dial direction, I have it as normal, because I'm a normal Canon shooter. But if you're if you're a Nikon shooter, you might want to reverse the controls. Um, and then custom controls, what do we have here? So I'm a back button focuser, so I use these buttons at the back to focus with. So the first thing I do is to use the first custom control to with my shutter button to deactivate so it doesn't do the autofocus, it just does metering and shutter control. So the shutter button will just start the metering and take a picture, not autofocus. And then I have these custom controls linking to these buttons so that the back button focus points here will all work the autofocus. It's just my way of doing things, everyone else has their own way. I've changed the depth of field preview button so rather than giving you a depth of field preview, now it actually sw helps you flip between one shot and AI servo, which is one shot is great for kind of locking the focus on to, let's say, eyes during a portrait shoot. An AI servo is actually a tracking uh, focus, so it will actually track something that moves towards you. So this is a really useful setting for me. If Let's say I'm doing a portrait and then suddenly the person kind of just for fun starts running towards you and you're using a long lens. Typically, the one shot would not really cut it under those conditions. You need uh, AI servo. But to change the camera over to AI servo means kind of bringing your other hand up to here and flipping a few controls. So, it, you know, it might take a few seconds. Whereas with this custom control, you can just hold down the, the, a, the, the depth of field preview button and the camera will instantly go into servo mode if you were in one shot before or vice versa. It just means that you can work very quickly. Very, very useful. Found that very useful. The lens AF stop button, that's just the same as it always is. Um, that's just the same as it always is. Set button, I've got this set to adjust my ISO, which I find really useful. Really, really useful because I flip between ISO quite, you know, I might go between 400 to 100 to 800, 600, you know, depending on the circumstances quite often. And that enables me to change that really quickly rather than having to fiddle around on the top of the normal button. Or, or certainly, you know, half a second quicker. I have my main dial set typically to just do the shutter speed and then the dial on the back to do the aperture and then this multi-function uh, controller here I have it set to move my air point around which is really cool that means that everything is pretty much at hand I suppose let's just go back to the menu over here um, we have these two things which I don't really use very much at all and then we go over to my menu and I have this the my menu is brilliant on this camera because it enables you to bring some of the things that you use more regularly into one menu and so I have my custom white balance if I need to fiddle with that here I have my HDR mode if I need to fiddle with that format card which is something that I use all the time beep like I said before I have that here and then my sensor cleaning which is very useful so all the things that I use quite regularly I can access just using the green star I was going to talk about HDR because this camera does have built-in HDR and it has this custom button up here with like a paintbrush thing in a box which is really useful and I wish they carried that over into the into some of the newer cameras because it enables you to go and quickly adjust your picture style if you want to or you can adjust your multiple exposure if that's your thing it's not something that I do too often to be honest but you can then instantly get into HDR quite quickly HDR means that the camera will take three pictures and then, or five pictures and then mulch them together and spit out a JPEG at the end of it. Um, I use this sometimes, seems to work reasonably well and you come in here and adjust dynamic range and you can then choose how many stops you want. Typically I'll go for two, two stops between each different frame that it takes of the three that it takes. And then the effect I'll just leave on natural. And then you can, with continuous HDR, you can decide whether you want it to be just the one shot that you're about to take that's going to do the blend, or whether it's every shot. And you need to be quite cautious about leaving it on every shot because, you know, if you leave it on every shot and forget, then every time you take a picture, it'll take three, <laughs> which can be a little bit annoying. So we'll go back in and disable that just so we are there. Now, and also I should say that it, there is this setting here which... It auto image aligns if you want it to do that and also it will save your source images if you want to um, which is quite handy actually because it means that if the blend doesn't work from the HDR mode it means that you've actually got um, you've actually got the raw files as well which is worth worth thinking about and that's pretty much it so I really do hope there is something of use for you here. Um, please bear in mind that this is just my opinion and my experience so far of how I set my camera up. It will be evolving. These things always do. No one is ever right nor wrong. It's all subjective. 
and we each have to find our own way on this twisted journey through the world of being photographers. Um, please do subscribe if you like this kind of content and you know leave me a comment it's always great to hear from everybody really appreciate everybody's um, positive comments it's lovely to hear from everybody thank you very much for watching I wish you all the very best goodbye <laughs>